Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So thank you for joining me tonight. I have got something that I've wanted to share with you guys for a very, very long time. And I think that uh, uh, maybe it's going to be worth a lot of money to someone somewhere at some point. But I think it's important to make this public now. Um, it's going to be an imperfect presentation because I have a lot to get through in the coming weeks and months and I just want to get this out of the door and get it off my back. Uh, that's the honest truth there. So um, for those of the, you that have Space Earth Human, uh, uh, what we will come to at the end of this presentation is um, a chart and some discussion around it which is on page 127. So if you've got it to hand, either as your uh, Kickstarter digital copy or as a um, printed copy like this, go and get that and get yourself to page 127 and see if you can guess before the end of this presentation where I'm going and what the purpose is of it. Anyway, so the uh, title of the presentation is, if I actually put it on the screen, Fast Track to Coherence, and if I lose my mugshot, uh, what we are looking at on the screen there, on the um, background, is the first look that I had with the Narugu uh, uh, microscope uh, on one of the vibrator plates from Roy Shinomaza. And this was a, a steel plate that had just been used that day. I think I probably have it here, I think it's. I think it's actually might be this one, or uh, I think it's the one that I cut. Um, let me see if I can find it. Anyway, it, it it'll probably be the one that I cut, um, which may or may not be. Uh, anyway, I think it's either one of these two, either that one or or this one. And uh, I had a quick look around of there. You can go and see the video on um, the MFMP's YouTube channel, and. On it, I found uh, a wide array of structures, and one of the first ones I found was this figure of eight. Where have we seen that before? And not only is it a figure of eight, it has very tight spots in the center of the frame. Uh, and here's two others. Now, this uh, do, it seems to have an interfering boundary here and two spots that look very similar. So this might be vortexes that are going around the same direction, maybe. Uh, or, um, Possibly, so there's some interference, you don't get a, a field effect here. These could be uh, um, vortex pairs, so you see this typically, we've seen this in many different systems, both uh, in hydrodynamic systems like this, and also in magnetohydrodynamic systems, like in the Lion Reactor and in the John Hutchison, Hutchison effect. And so you see the smaller one here and the bigger one, the smaller one and the bigger one. This is actually two on the same plate. And typically on the smaller one, there's not so much deposit. It's kind of like maybe coming out of there and it collides down onto here. So you get a, a big splodge on the impact zone. Um, so uh, in some of these central structures, we see some very interesting structures. This one is like a, a torus, which is uh, twisted like a braided torus. Uh, it seems to be split at this point and as maybe it came in at an angle and, and hit the, the deck here and, and came to rest here and uh, came to its demise, uh, potentially. And this one looks like it hit straight on and uh, fell apart. Uh, is that what you're seeing? I don't know, but uh, I think we can safely say that since I first shared this a long, long time ago, these figures of eight are very, very important in cavitation systems. Okay, so uh, how are we doing tonight? Who have we got? We've got Gordon Doherty in the house and David Boutlier, uh, Corky Goss, Simon Hayne. Hi, guys. Uh, hi, Artifact. So, everyone, I hope you're having a great hot summer's day here in the Northern Hemisphere. And if you're in Canada where it's nearly always cold, then, or, or in the uh, other extremes, then uh, sometimes that's nice too. Um, okay, so um, uh, one thing I think I just touch on here is uh, this is a recent presentation from a recent presentation. And this was a coherent matter structure, in my understanding, that was caught on the end of an HHO uh, needle um, and self-organized plasma. 
And I think what you'll find out here is that there is a capillary uh, uh, instability that's happening and you've got uh, the materials coming out and it's kind of like hitting a brick wall and it's kind of going around in a loop this way and going around in a loop this way and it creates a magnetohydrodynamic structure and, and that in turn creates the, the uh, sphere shape. Um, here's one in a Henk Vega experiment and this is going to become important to the discussions we're going to have tonight and also to potentially I want to go through the Vega Valley sample and give a shot at explaining that. I've been promising to do that for a long time also and so I think I might do that on Sunday. Um, but anyway, this is from a 2001 Journal of Plasma and Fusion Research uh, by Sebastian Popescu and E. Loznianu. Um, and this is a uh, their drawing of a normal ball of fire as they saw it in their systems uh, like the one that you see this small one that's kind of like always 50% onto a solid uh, surface. This one is actually on this metal nickel ribbon here and I've shown in other images of this because uh, this is from a video frame that the end of this pokes into the double layer but not completely through it. And what we found was uh, both in Dave's and Hank's system that if you drive this uh, hard then in my understanding the coherence gets to a point where uh, it interacts uh, on the inside surface either this side or this side of the coherent layer and I was saying it was coherent and I did a several of these videos and then someone sent me this 2012 book I think which was reviewing ball lightning and and these kind of uh, uh, plasmoid effects in, in various experiments and at the conclusion of the book was that probably these were creating coherent matter and um, so there we go um, I was wasn't going mad and essentially when it gets to a certain level of coherence and the electrons become degenerate they become almost like one large electron um, then it uh, interacts with the uh, metal in a way that it very rapidly destroys the metal and as it eats the metal it doesn't uh, seem to slow until it gets to a point of uh, 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 anti-resonance or resonance or a different state or in one case you saw with the tungsten uh, in a Henk experiment where it just cut the the tungsten wire but only on one or other of this uh, boundary and, and this is going to become important because um, in these systems uh, uh, you you what we're trying to achieve in my understanding is coherence and when everything's working together you can get a lot done that's when the community comes together to want to achieve something we can get a lot done uh, when we're all working in different directions nothing happens uh, and uh, that is always been the problem even in the Lena field so um, so essentially the the co coherence is where you want to get to uh, and when you get a certain level of coherence uh, um, this forces especially if, if it's a condensate uh, you, you can get more and more and more and more and more matter in a very small uh, 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 dimension and this does weird things which we have observed. Okay, so I'm going to switch to different thing here. Uh, hi Glass Chappie, good to have you in the house here. Okay, uh, yeah, you've got page 127 there. Okay, good. Okay, so I am going to go and pull up a series of things that I want to talk to. So we will all be talking to this, not that. We'll be talking to this. Um, okay. And we will be talking to this. So pretty much everything that I'm going to discuss today I've either um, been discussing over the last couple of years on uh, you on YouTube on the MFMP's YouTube or on uh, in the last uh, nine months or seven months or something since November on remoteview.icu so you can go and f go back to those things and, and and find out what I'm talking about blathering about okay so uh, you have all of these posts which are being kind of leading into a direction you can see uh, these Vega experiments uh, and uh, this is a very very important one and this is a very very important one and that's why they were my first two posts uh, to tell 
this ongoing story. Um, so uh, essentially, uh, one, one of the more recent presentations I did uh, was with, with, in reference to this uh, SY Low paper, which was from the 2nd of April 1984. And he's essentially uh, talking about using uh, lasers to force coherence uh, in uh, matter. And so uh, really, and, and, and coming up with the idea of uh, a, a baser, a baser. So here we go. We've got, we got the, the baser here, baser mechanisms. And a, a baser is effectively coherent matter. And that is what I believe we are seeing when we are looking at uh, coherent matter in a uh, reactor such as the Vega experiments. Okay, so uh, I think he was at well ahead of the game, but can certainly contemporary with this, and even prior to this, was the work of John Hutchison, and obviously it would appear that he was creating coherent matter, and that is kind of the conclusion that uh, Ken Shoulders came to, and uh, you can actually look at his uh, some of his work. This is a document from 2004, uh, and he's talking about electron condenser and creating condensed electrons and he talks about you know what, what that will mean but it's essentially he's going back to the work of Bostick here and uh, um, so well in, in fact in, in in the case of Bostick that iron electron pairs but it is plasmoids it is kind of what we are looking at when we are referring to these kind of features here as well okay so um let me go back to, uh, sorry if you can hear the noise in the background, I hope you can't, but maybe you can. <laughs> um, uh, life is returning to this city, so that's not a, such a bad thing, but it has its drawbacks as well. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, th this is CS Lamb and SY Low, and uh, this is the lead-in to uh, making um, basers, which are charge bunching. R notice that phrase, charge bunching of bosons in this case and so this would be a, a baser or a coherent matter uh, condensate of material but not at absolute zero okay so uh, then I so that was 1984 in 1992 in uh, 28th of the 12th 1992 I've referred to this Solin patent and in the Solin patent he used an I've lost my picture have I Okay, <laughs> uh, let me see if I can fix that. I think I've lost my picture. I don't know what happened there. So give me a second. Um, not that you probably want to see my mugshot. <laughs> okay, give me a second. I'll find out what's going on here. Um, Uh, all the links uh, to various presentations are given in the presentations that are associated with these various topics. That, that, that a lot of what I'm sharing tonight is going over some old ground in a very, very... Uh, yes, the face cam is off, yes. It, in very, very limited ways um, to get to the point that I want to share with you tonight. Uh, which I think uh, is just has to be said now. Um, Okay, what's happened now? Uh, uh, maybe it's a heat thing. In the winter, there was no problems. Uh, now, now we're in the hotter months. It's it's like nearly thirty degrees here today, and it's not much cooler right now in this office. So maybe it's something to do with that. Have to bear that in mind. Okay, so. Um, I need to do this. Okay. Okay. All right, I'm back in the room. Okay. All right, so um yeah, so what what he's got here is an industrial arc furnace and um what that has here is a, a free electron. It's gone again, isn't it? Oh dear. All right. Well, you might have to do without my ugly mug shot today. I'm sure you'll be happy about that. Maybe I can switch to a different camera. 
Uh, uh, da, da, da. I think actually, Bootlier, uh, David, the, the reason this wasn't more widely known is because it was in Russian. Uh, and, you know, it, people in the West aren't tending to search in Russian languages, and the patent was old. Uh, it's like almost at the start of the internet that it was submitted. Uh, maybe it wasn't published until much more recently in a broader sense. So, yeah, but the, the, the Solian pattern gets so much right, um, it's, it's, it's incredible. But I've talked about it at length, so um, I can't tell you exactly what's going on here. Um, it might be the camera overheating. Uh, that is a risk with a Blackmagic camera. If it goes, I will switch to the face cam on the uh, Mac, which is doesn't really matter, does it? <laughs> I need some things that work at better temperatures. Okay, all right. There we go. <laughs> Let's see if it lasts more than a few seconds. Okay. Um, right. So uh, yeah. So we got an electron beam coming in here. Uh, these are actually uh, things that can move in and out, and they are um, the same material that's in the melt down the bottom. And essentially what happens is you have a low vapor pressure metal. Uh, this means that it has a, a, a very distinct phase change between liquid and um, uh, solid. And also you don't get it forming uh, gaseous uh, particles uh, coming up. And this allows for uh, electron bunching and the electron bunching leads to uh, coherence. Uh, this forms two solitons. Uh, each soliton has opposite magnetic charges. Then these cluster together and uh, lead to electronuclear collapse. Um, in fact, like monopoles and then can lead to decay of nucleons and so forth. So he basically said everything uh, that you need to know about Lena in uh, this patent from 1992, which everyone's free to use. Um, there we go. Uh, <laughs> uh, except this is a huge industrial free electron laser uh, um, thing. It's not like, oh, there we go. It's, it is the heat. So I'm going to switch. I don't know whether I have... Uh, I might, this might affect the audio, um, okay, let me see what I can do here, because I have things to show you in my hands, but, um, might, might affect the loudness of my audio, I'm going to be off to one side, that doesn't matter, alright, sorry, it's going to be crummy vision, but who cares, um, uh, <laughs> Learn a new thing every day. Okay, I'm going to uh, bring up another slide so you've actually got something useful to look at um, for a second, uh, rather than just a blank screen. Um. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, so th this was uh, the Solon patent. Uh, then uh, we, I, I talked about, uh, so the Solon patents from 1992. Uh, this is the um, uh, suggestion in uh, July the 12th uh, uh, to the 14th, 2000, um, at the Linear Accelerator meeting uh, in Japan. And 
so um, what he is referring to, this is uh, Takaki Matsumoto, he's referring to bunched protons with high energy and then bunched electrons with high energy. And we already know that bunched electrons uh, from here and from wherever else, uh, they lead to coherence. And then you've got your bunched protons uh, from your linear accelerator, and that leads to the generation of an itonic cluster. And the itonic cluster, uh, according to Takaaki Matsumoto, is the equivalent of, drum roll, um, ball lightning. The same thing that you are seeing here, and the same thing you are seeing here in the Vega experiments. Okay, so um, uh, that's that. Uh, then we can talk about this paper from 2003 from S. V. Adamenko and Vladimir Vysotsky, and they are talking about um, uh, forcing coherence and electronuclear collapse. So this is mechanism of the synthesis of super heavy nuclei via the process of controlled electron nuclear collapse. So this is in 2003, and uh, Takaaki Matsumoto is calling this process electronuclear collapse quite a long time before uh, they came on the scene calling it electron nuclear collapse. Um, so in, in uh, Takaaki Matsumoto he calls it ENR, as in electronuclear reactions. Okay, and they talk in here, maybe I've got some highlighted bits, I don't know. Oh no, I've got I've got this in a um in PDF, so let me show you that there. So here we go. So um So, to the creation of a super heavy nuclei in collisions of heavy nuclei to overcome the Coulomb barrier or through pion condensation in the nucleus volume. For a neutral atom compressed by external forces, a threshold electron density is shown to exist. If such a density is reached, a self organizing process of electron downfall to the nucleus starts. This process is exogenic, uh, exoenergenic, and uh, sorry, <laughs> exoenergic. <laughs> and leads to the formation of a super compressed electron nuclear cluster. So uh, they're kind of basically agreeing with Takaaki Matsumoto, although the method of creating it is very, very much different between the two. The synthesis proceeds through the absorption of other nuclei by the collapsed nucleus. Okay. The release of binding energy through the absorption of nuclei by the electron nuclear collapse clusters may result in simultaneous emission of lighter nuclei, i.e. you create heavier nuclei and you create lighter nuclei. And this is exactly what you see in Lena. So I'm just going to jump to a couple of pieces in this. Um, so uh, this collapse of degenerate electron gas in the Coulomb field of the nucleus is analogous to the phenomena of gravitation collapse of an astrophysical object with the mass being more than the critical one and the shell of a degenerate relativistic gas is neutralized by the charge of the nuclei. So they're effectively saying this is a bit like a black hole. This is exactly what is said by Takaaki Matsumoto. The process involves both nucleus and adjoining system of degenerate electrons. The expression for the full interaction of energy of electrons with the nucleus is deduced on the basis of Dirac equation with regards for both relativistic and nonlinear effects. Um, super heavy nuclei which are considered in the frame of the universal hydrodynamic model, hydrodynamic model, hydrodynamic model of a nucleus in the presence of a degenerate electron gas. Thus, in an ideal situation, the external impact is required only during the initiation phase, and then the global transformation of nuclear matter under its own self-similar laws with the use of internal energy sources starts. Hence, the role of the first phase in the nuclear transformation is similar to the role of the first photon in laser generation. Laser generation. In our opinion, the electron subsystem plays the key role during the internal self-organizing process at the nuclear and subnuclear substance levels. And I think that's... No, I've got a point I want to say here. Nuclei interact with the nearest electron environment and attract electrons. And attract electrons. This is exactly what is being said by... Uh, shoulders in his book EV a tale of discovery in 1986 this is published in nine, uh, 2004 from 2003 
This actual reactor and where Vysotsky and Adamenko did all their work, and, and be bearing in mind this was a one-tenth of C, 300 joule discharge, into a target, um, this, this produced transmutation, massive transmutation, first time and every time for thousands of times. And they, it's a massive, massive study. I think it was something like 600 man years uh, in the uh, Moscow, uh, not the Moscow, the uh, Kiev uh, old uh, Soviet isotope factory, um, which they rented from the beginning of 2000-2001. Uh, the device, uh, which was running then under Proton 21 labs, that went to the US and then that moved to, um, I think it's Brookhaven National Laboratory. I think it's at Brookhaven now. So the US nuclear authorities at the very highest level are taking this work completely seriously. Pressure of this kind renders the compressed quasi-atom. So they're saying these very large amounts of atoms in this uh, overall super uh, cluster uh, to be unstable relative to the spontaneous self-compression of the plasma. Self-compression of the plasma and to the subsequent unlimited increase in the electron density. Unlimited increase in the electron density. In this case, the compression of the relativistic degenerate gas occurs without loss of its ideality. The self-reinforcing process, self reinforcing process of irreversible self-compression of the degenerate electron gas is accompanied by the downfall of electron shells of the compressed quasi-atom to the nucleus and results in the full collapse of the electron nuclear plasma in the volume of the particular wignerstite cell. So this is a more thorough explanation of the mechanisms that you would imagine are going on in electronuclear collapse. However, um, it was already uh, all characterized by uh, um, Takaaki Matsumoto in the 1990s. And effectively, it was, uh, um, coined, it, it, it was understood uh, to explain John Hutchison's work um, in the 1980s by Ken Shoulders. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the main part. So when, when you are seeing... Um, these things. I'm suggesting that the the area which this occurs is on this kind of little boundary area. When it gets enough um, uh, pressure, so you've got the the ions in the core, um, uh, and uh, may or may not be, but you have at least a boundary of ions, um, and you've got the electron sort of flux trying to come in. And uh, the, there's a point where one's pushing out and the other one's pushing in. <laughs> and, and so you, you have a literal physical layer um, and, and that's got pressure. And, and you can imagine if it gets loaded and gets loaded and gets loaded, it gets to the point where they become coherent and then they self-collapse. They self-compress and self-collapse. Okay, so uh, I'm going to try again to get some mug shot. Um, we shall see if this works. Um, I will leave you what will I do um, mm -hmm. so yeah so that is Adamenko from 2004 uh, then uh, I, I talked about this which is making coherent matter wave beams and their capabilities and um, I, I, it, you should go and look at this presentation because it talks about the Aronhoff bomb effect which is known for an extremely long time uh, effectively the CIA have talked about it in the past the Hutchison uh, effect is is to a certain extent that uh, and uh, this kind of led to this patent uh, which is from uh, um, well published uh, no, uh, 22nd of November 2016 but it's actually uh, awarded with a priority date of uh, December the 28th uh, 2011 I think and this is the patent of um, uh, Lockheed Martin and they have some little spikes that create uh, uh, exotic vacuum objects effectively and they go through uh, these resonant cavities and that forces them to cohere and they come out as a coherent uh, matter wave beam and they argue and this is very very important and I do want <laughs> I do want to uh, have a, um, a shot to, to physically show you what I'm trying to describe here but this is the 
um, key point here. Fortunately, this dramatic energy enhancement due to phase synchronization of photons is not limited to electromagnetic waves alone. Rather, it is a property of wave phenomena and may be applicable to all kinds of waves. According to quantum mechanics, particles may be waves, e.g. de Broglie waves, and may remember that de Broglie, de Broglie waves, and may be subject to the phase coherence. However, creating currents amongst particle waves, matter waves, may not be as easy as for photon, photon waves. And so for using conventional technologies, uh, the only achievable coherent matter wave has been at near absolute zero and for a very small number of particles, e.g. in the order of thousands or millions and only for bosons. So this is a Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, but essentially, if you go through this paper, and I've already argued and discussed this uh, uh, paper before in detail, but essentially all you need to have is the same particle that in the same phase and at the same uh, energy, uh, kinetic energy, uh, and then uh, you can get them to cohere. And in fact, if you imagine this boundary that you see here uh, and here, that this boundary is is a place where um, the temperature has to become exactly the same. And if it's the same thing coming in, which is either you know it's electrons, let's say. Um, uh, then they can form Cooper pairs and the Cooper pairs then become coherent and uh, as they become coherent they basically lose their individual identity and effectively start acting as one large electron. Okay. So uh, I, I kind of talked about similar topics and when I'm uh, looking at these and saying that this is due to a vortex uh, we have many examples to show of this kind of effect and none so much as we, we, we looked at here in the um, ultra experiments where you see these two things together and you can see this actual uh, vortex, this mini tornado and this was also nailed by um, Takaaki Matsumoto in his 90s papers. Um, but you can see these figure of eights here um, on uh, al aluminium foil and uh, here is uh, some again on aluminium foil with this uh, carbon rich uh, deposit which uh, does smack of something very similar to that was observed on the Huang paper from last week at 2000, uh, in the uh, ICCF 23. So we, we've talked a lot about this but also they seem to perform uh, form these pairs which then have this slight offset so this is what I call the pretzel and this one is on the palladium coated steel vibrator plate of Roy Shinomaza. I, I don't I, I can't remember what this one is it's the it's the one with the magnesium chloride yes and uh, in this um, we had a carbon like diamond uh, in the center points here and uh, we had these vortices and we showed um, in a presentation that you can go and find on our uh, site and I think I'll link to it maybe on the um, uh, blog for this at remoteview.ico we showed that um, you, you have magnesium in these kind of like galaxy arms and then you have the chromium on the outside and that if you take uh, two magnesiums and you fuse those together you end up with chromium and so um, and if you look at this video the the it's it's essentially what I'm saying is there's different levels of pressure in this structure and essentially this is an analog for a spiral or, or, uh, or a, a kind of galaxy type thing where the pressure leads to the formation of dense matter and uh, other streaming uh, material in the cosmos around the galaxy so um, uh, and, and if you take the uh, um, where is it uh, the center point here the actual center point that you see here on the optical microscope this this on um, the SEM this is where you get the carbon forming it's interesting that uh, effectively a lighter element gets formed at the point of you kind of like the center of, of the vortex and uh, you know maybe you can understand that that is because it's the arrangement that uh, um, neutrons and protons and, and and the electrons that are bound within them uh, uh, would need to form uh, if they were under kind of like maximum pressure it's kind of like a, a regular array of of those isn't it a tetrahedral structure okay so um 
And 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 this this was in the cavitator for Ultra. This is in the uh, Amaza vibrator plate. And this was uh, this one here is not on the surface, uh, if you recall. This is in this video where I reviewed some of Martin Lammer's uh, uh, Ultra experiments. And you actually got the double vortex overlaid with the central spot in the free fluid. And these are what I call sprites, which I first saw in Suhas Ralkar's lab. And these are extremely good versions of them. Now, the interesting thing is that um, Ultra Experiments produced these spheres, which were also produced by other Lena uh, experimenters, uh, which were working in different systems. Um, but if you recall, this was carbon-rich film on the outside. So what is that implying? Well, it's implying that the inside here, uh, because if we, if we are arguing that the maximum pressure is where the diamond is formed, or the carbon film, as Matsumoto calls it, then... Uh, that might be this out outside layer here and we've got the iron inside or is it just like like we see here um, in this they're arguing that all of the irons are in the center and I mean I-O-N-S not I-R-O-N-S <laughs> all the irons are in the center and uh, it's a highly magnetic structure and that on the boundary layer you get the formation of uh, the the carbon so is that what we are seeing here and does this kind of structure if this was wetted together into a, a more uh, elongated structure does this kind of explain some of the things that we see in the Vega Valley Okay, um, then then we kind of like uh, have these uh, structures on the Hutchison sample, and we talked about the the toroidal potential structure in Evo. We talked about the guions uh, of J. Archibald Weaver from 1954, and how they are very similar. And uh, we have shown this uh, recently, which is uh, where they think they've discovered something new. But obviously, uh, John Hutchison was doing this, and Ken Shoulders was doing this, and la 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 la. But uh, these people need to <laughs> get another grant, I guess. So, uh, um, physicists harness thousands of molecules into a single quantum state. Wow, well done. <laughs> this is the 28th of April, 2021. And guess what? They end up with a hexagonal structure, which is a donut. It's like just like everything we see in these uh, kind of structures. Um, either a donut or, or, or a sphere. And we see these uh, kind of effects. Now, th this is the magnetohydrodynamic structure on the lion uh, um, quartz. And so this isn't within uh, a liquid like we are seeing with the ultra experiments and what, what I showed at the start with the um, solitons uh, uh, and the um, counter-rotating so uh, vortex and solitons on the uh, Amasa vibrator plates. Um, but essentially, uh, this is doing the same kind of coherence. And you can see these kind of do like donut shapes like this. But uh, uh, I believe that these, uh, if you tried to look at them when they're doing their business, you wouldn't really see much. I mean, so. <laughs> and again, you can see where some of them are interfering. These these ones are going the other way. So you get the, the spot in the center, the spot in the center. So I've got those marked out. And there's a very various uh, ones here, which I've talked about before. Um, uh, and uh, these are the analogs of the uh, charged uh, uh, solitons and their field uh, uh, sort of uh, influence area and the same solitons that are uh, talked about by Solin and Solin uh, here we have the uh, under and over and over and under inside and outside uh, this isn't the one on the outside of the quartz. And so this is what I'm referring to with Solon. So Solon is saying that you get a, a north and a south uh, magnetic monopole solitons. And uh, it, they form these structures. And uh, these are magnetohydrodynamic structures. And we've seen them throughout. And I've talked about it looking something like this in the past. And so forth. So very shortly, we're going to come to the meat of, the, meat of this discussion. Uh, um, uh, this was just the grounding. So um, uh, we we talked about how uh, these structures, if they build up and they blow up, uh, they will release these uh, coherent matter uh, uh, wave beams. Um, and this is the kind of thing that we've seen. 
this is in Dave's experiment. And this was not noticed by the author by Ken Shoulders. So this is, he's looking at the holes going through these impact points. But he kind of missed this kind of track, which is uh, probably created by uh, a coherent matter wave beam uh, like the one that Dave uh, created. And here is another one uh, that I captured from a Dave video. Oh, sorry. Oh, no. Oh, what's gone on now? No, I don't want that. I want that one um coherent matter wave beam uh, and you can see here it in motion and again when you watch this happen on the video there's like a it builds up it builds up then there's an explosion and then something comes out and it is a beam and i believe it's coherent matter and uh, we'll have more data to share showing that. And th this this structure is extremely similar to the structure that was observed uh, coming out of uh, um, uh, some work by Dmitry Baranov. Uh, this is in a, I think, a exposed uh, bismuth salt. Uh, bismuth sulfate it is. And then here's another one, different coherent matter wave beams with these type of structures, periodic structures, and this is it interacting with material. And then we talked about all kinds of different coherent matter uh, uh, effects, but essentially you see this exploding out of here. They come out of something which is birthing them, that is nurturing them, that is growing them. And so you need that to create it. It doesn't happen instantaneously. And we when when you understand this and that kind of explains what um was uh, uh, observed by um uh, um suhas ralkar that he had to expose his fuel to ultrasonics for 140 hours plus or so before he saw any excess heat um uh, in when he put the fuel in the reactor and i believe that this is building up coherent matter and from the Baranoff work that you see here, um, not here, from the Baranoff work that you see here, this was emitting uh, strange radiation like 18 months afterwards. And when I looked at uh, Suhas Saralkar's ultrasonically produced fuel, that was producing strange radiation tracks. In fact, the first ones that I uh, was able to detect uh, about uh, two or three months after its uh, production. So it stays active for a long time. In the, in the case of uh, um, uh, the workers at the Moscow Physics Institute, they were seeing these things actually moving around on the surface two days after they uh, did a plasma flow, uh, water flow discharge. And so uh, these things can survive for a long period of time. So you have to condition the fuel. You have to kind of drive it and drive it and drive it. And effectively what you're doing is he kind of doing what we do uh, very, very quickly in the Vega experiments? That is to say, nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens. And then suddenly it gets to a point where there's enough coherence on here that it eats and eats and eats and eats and eats the material. And what you want is to create this coherent matter stuff so that it is in a soliton form, like uh, something like this, um, but trapped in... Uh, so it looks a bit like this, uh, and it's doing this to the material, but it's trapped in that kind of plasmoid, long-lived state. And in, in that uh, instance, I think Ed Lewis was one of the very first people to, uh, um, and you should go and look at his warning documents on, on uh, plasmoid uh, persistence in metals particular. Um, he, he said that, you know, once you have a piece of material that is in this state, the plasmoids are in there for very long, you know. And, and Ken Shoulders said, absolutely, indefinitely, unless you intentionally blow them up, he would say. Um, so, yeah, it's not something that disappears immediately. Okay. So, uh, then I want to talk about... Um, these papers and i gave it a link to a couple of these in the um uh the uh, remote view.icu blog but this is work by roger stringham and so he caught on to the uh reality um i think just around about the same time that that book was published on studying ball lightning and this is in uh 2012 that this was published 
And he's saying, a model for electromagnetic pulsed Bose-Einstein condensate experiments. Model for electromagnetic pulsed Bose-Einstein condensate experiments. Solar fusion experiments which incorporate transient Bose-Einstein condensate, BEC, have recently focused uh, on related sono superconductivity. So to be superconduct superconductive, it must be uh, coherent. Um, cavitation jets implant high density deuteron clusters into a target foil. Clusters are then squeezed by accelerated charges that form dense trans transient electromagnetic pulses. Cavitation and associated sonoluminescence phenomena used as a measuring tool helps develop and explain related experimental results. Two outcomes, sonofusion and sono superconductivity, both produce D plus clusters in the reactions of different geometries. Megahertz reactor number one is driven by this, blah, 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 blah. But basically, when you go through these papers uh, around this time in, in um, the thinking of Roger Stringham, uh, so uh, he is saying that this forms uh, a sheath of coherent electrons and uh, coherent ions in the core and then this self compresses and so um th th this is the uh, um sort of building up of the bubble and then the collapse and the production of the sol sono luminescent pulse and also the re-entrant jet here and these are the light pulses and uh this is a device here just so here is uh, his model and so on the outside you have this sheath of coherent electrons and they go into self-compression mode sounds very familiar doesn't it and uh, he actually argues it very well and so i think between this and the paper by uh, um sv adamenko and vladimir vysotsky you 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 can get a good understanding without how this electronuclear collapse process works and if you look at uh, the work of Takaki Matsumoto, you can understand the range of nuclear reactions and, and nuclear regeneration that you can achieve using this technology. And so um, this is the model, uh, and uh, it, he goes into various depths of it here. Here, here are some pits that are created at resonant nodes. Um, and yeah, okay. Um, I think I'll go to a different paper than this. Anyway, all, all the papers will be shared, but if you go to the LENA uh, uh, events database uh, on um, the uh, nanosoft.co.nz, you can uh, get these documents. Okay, and then there's this paper here. Again, this is from 2014, and this is Sonofusion's Transient Condensate Clusters. Okay, so he says here, D2O cavitation produces Z-pinch jets implanting a target lattice. Measurements, data interpretations, and uh, FESEM photos uh, explain products of heat and four helium produced in target foils. The picosecond dynamics of deuteron electron plasma charge separation, charge separation, and pressure pulse uh, produce alpha particles and heat. Okay, so... It says, over 20 years of work, including thousands of experiments, have contributed to the explanation of the puzzling and disjointed aspects of sonofusion technology, which is a very old technology, by the way. <laughs> Using new analytical techniques and data interpretations give a fresh look at sonofusion processes at megahertz frequencies. Among the resolved problems was the target foil destruction associated with kilohertz low frequency problems. As time passed, it appeared that Bose-Einstein condensates in the form of nuclear condensates would lead to paths that resolved some major problems. And so essentially he's saying here that the pulses that you get out uh, and uh, the, the helium production is due to Bose-Einstein condensates. So very simple devices. There's the peaks again. Now here, here he's got here. Um, so th this is actually a very important drawing. So I'm just going to talk through what you're seeing here. This is an el electron minus, E minus, over here, Cooper pair condensate. E minus Cooper pair condensate. And this compresses, and he, he, he argues in these series of papers how the self-compression proceeds. Once, once it started, it just proceeds. And then inside, you've got the positive ions and this is very much like you see the model here with the electrons on the outside and the positive ions okay and so um 
These are deutrons, and uh, this is also a uh, um, condensate in the, the core here. And he argues that effectively th the electron sheath compresses into a point that it, it, two deutrons fuse, uh, and you get a helium, and the energy produced causes it to kick out. I argue uh, that this might occur, but also it might be the case that uh, the energy is passed into the electron condensate, the, the Cooper pair condensate, and it just doesn't get out. It gets radiated uh, or it gets synthesized into uh, neutrinos and they become part of the overall structure as was argued in 1990 by Takaki Matsumoto. Okay, so um, there's some points there. La la la. There's a nice, is it in this one? There's a nice diagram in this one. I'm trying to avoid all signs of uh, uh, calculations. Okay. So I've actually highlighted some key points in here. Right. Solid fusion experiments which incorporate transient bose einstein constants have been recently focused on... Okay, so we read that before. Okay. That's our diagram. Pinch, Z-pinch deutrons and electrons of the jet plasma were implanted into a target... Uh, producing a femtosecond electron-deutron charge separation. That's a really quick electron-deutron charge separation. Femtoseconds are not very long. They are not very long. Accelerated electrons compressed deutrons uh, into Bose-Einstein condensate clusters via a picosecond electromagnetic pulse. Uh, that's the thing. Da -da -da. Okay, I don't know if I've got anything else I want to say from this one. Okay, so I actually highlighted these documents after I got back uh, from um, visiting uh, Roy Shinomaza in 2019. So it's taken me a bit of time to get here. <laughs> so yeah, in this one, I'll just pull out this phrase particularly. The extreme picosecond densities, this is a different paper. The extreme picosensity uh, sensor... Oh! The extreme picosecond densities of free electrons form Bose boson charged particles. Cooper pairs, CPs, that work together to squeeze the mass. Uh, uh, Cooper pairs with like charges have energies of attraction across a mutual phase boundary. Cooper pairs with like charges have energies of attraction across a mutual phase boundary. So you have something that's been accepted by uh, uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory. And you have something that here that uh, is being worked on by Tom Clayter and another guy uh, that worked at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And in each case, they are agreeing with Ken Shoulders that at, when you get it to the certain state, that electrons attract more than they repel. The shrinking triangle formed by produce this pressure and spherical compression. So yeah, you have this spherical compression piston. This explains the magnetic field and how that does the work. It's actually really nicely detailed, uh, um, this paper. Um, anyway, may maybe I'll separately uh, address uh, my notes in this paper. Um, but they have one diagram in here which I think is quite nice. Uh, so this is uh, the 1.6 megahertz, one micron squared. So you have very many pits in a high frequency. So you have, if you have more frequent, if you have more uh, megahertz, like more cycles per second, you'll actually get more nodes. And it's the nodes that build and build and build and build and build and build and build, and build uh, uh, the effect that leads to the transmutation. So. Uh, um, it can be quite extreme in, in these cases. Whereas if you have a lower frequency, it just works with the lower frequency. It doesn't almost matter how low you go. Uh, you will get some of this occurring. And he says the middle palladium foil here, 46 kilohertz. And using 46 kilohertz, he's actually gone here. Titanium, uh, oh, whatever. Nodal lines at 46 kilohertz are 0.33 centimeters squared. So, sorry, this is on a 0.33 centimeter squared section, I guess. So you've got... Uh, the node lines here. So, you know, uh, this is well, well described. It's not 
Mm. What Roger Stringham has done is extremely detailed in describing effectively what uh, an ultra experiment will do and it will do these things um but you know it's it, these are bespoke devices and we're just using a, a 35 dollar ultrasonic cleaner anyway my point being is that they're talking about uh spherical uh cooper pair coherent matter uh, condensates that are able to compress um, in a self, uh, the, my overall argument, a self compressing process uh, where you have uh, um, which accelerates and does electronuclear collapse. And we have multiple parties that are accepted by multiple major US labs over a long period of time that this process occurs. And you can do it yourself. Even a five year old can do it. And so. Um, the plasma contents of the bubble have become rearranged such that high density deuteron plasma is confined and compressed by the electromagnetic pressure of a sheath of electrons carried over from the bubble's interface. An encircling and squeezing B field further compresses the jet, narrowing its radius and further accelerating the jet's sheath electrons. In the absence of intervention, this pressure will narrow the jet's radius until it disintegrates entirely an effect that has frustrated tokamak type research directions. Uh, at the bottom of, I think it might be this article. Yeah, so uh, two hydrogen plus plus boson and the M system. In 1992 to 1993, experiments run with light water, H2O, showed similar uh, target foil melting characteristics that are found with D2O and some low calorimetry measured uh, QX heating. The hope was that these experiments would serve as zero points for QX measurements. This was not the case, but the results were interesting. In keeping with the model, H2O systems would produce some M condensates originating as a Z-pinch implant of H2 plus. So I guess this is the H2 gas when you've lost one electron. So it's an ion of H2. With a spin one, H2 plus would exhibit the bosonic character. So this is what you call a composite boson. Okay. Would exhibit the bosonic character common to uh, systems with attractive image charges. However, condensates with H plus with a spin of half lack the necessary bosonic character and would not compress sufficiently. This explains the lower QX for H2O systems than D2O systems. So essentially saying you want higher energy, you go to um, uh, using uh, uh, D, D plus systems. Um, and there we go. So you can use water in these things. Uh, and I think that's probably all I want to say on that. Okay, I'm going to try and get a camera because I want to do some hand gesturing uh, as I start uh, um, uh, <laughs> hand visually talking about the, the process that's necessary to explain the, the last part of, of this presentation. So, here's everyone in the house. Um, okay, so any, if anyone's got any questions now while I try and work out a separate camera, uh, let me know. So you're just going to go to color bars. Actually, David, you're saying that yours, it says 40 kilohertz. Actually, most of them are actually in the 34 around that. If you actually crack these devices open, the actual transducer is lower. Right. Just 
talk amongst yourselves. I should do some cheesy intro uh, intermission music, shouldn't I? When when films weren't three and a half hours long with with forty minutes of adverts, uh, you could go to the cinema and they had to switch the reels when I was a child, and uh, this was wonderful because uh, you know you could go and relieve yourself and uh, uh, go and get a snack whilst they changed the reels. It was much more civilized. <laughs> Okay, let's see if we can get some joy here. How hard can it be? <laughs> oh damn it! Why does it get so warm? I wonder if it'll survive for a few minutes. Should we try it? I think we'll try it. Temperature's dropped a little bit in the room. Okay, let, let me just see if I can try that. I don't know how long this is going to last. <laughs> okay. So, um, over the last several months, I've been talking about uh, a lot of different methods to cohere matter. Uh, um, and essentially what you want to do is get things squished into a, a particular place or try and get them so that they are the same thing at the same temperature. That is the absolute key to this. The same thing at the same temperature. And... At a vortex in the center of, of the vortex, that's a good place. And in the uh, uh, electron double layer, that's a good place. And in one of these forced electronuclear collapse uh, scenarios where you have, uh, um, you know, a, a discharge. And there we go. <laughs> it's got <laughs> an ice pack on it. I don't know. It's just never been like this. It's gone again. All right. Oh dear. <laughs> Everything worked great when it was the winter. <laughs> David might have got it. Yes, David might have got it. Well done, David. You've been paying attention. <laughs> okay. It's a, a, a little more interesting than that, Dave. But it's a good start where you're where you're thinking. You, you're you're very close. You're very very close. 
So I think the prize goes to David for being the closest. <laughs> you'd, you'd never got there if I didn't lose my camera, so <laughs> now nah, you would have done. <laughs> I'm sure. All right, let's. Oh dear. Lordy. Okay. I, I don't know whether. I, I have a camera, but um, I think it's going to be so, so out of sync. Super, super frustrating. I don't know if I take the battery out. <laughs> I'm gonna do it. Give it some more air. I'll try. I've only got to wave my arms around for a few seconds. <laughs> I've been wanting to say this for about a year, so <laughs> just have to bear with me. Honestly, maybe I'll, it'll it'll run better off the battery for a second. Okay, we got it running off the battery. Don't know whether this will. Create less or more heat, probably more heat. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so essentially, whatever it is, you're trying to pack stuff, you're trying to charge separate. So you've got your ions over here. Let's say this is your H2 plus ions or your D ions or whatever it is, your composite bosons uh, or your bosons, uh, which is why I put into the uh, Lena reaction calculator whether you can choose a boson or not, because those would preferentially do the work. And then you have electrons which you need to get bunched somehow from your charge separation and, and cause them to uh, uh, force them to cohere by forcing them together, bunching them together. So Solin does that by having an electron free laser. Uh, um, it's being done by however method in the proposal by Matsumoto. I believe that when you're creating ball lightning, and there it goes. <laughs> okay, we're gonna we're not gonna worry about it. Okay. <laughs> oh dear. Oh dear. Oh. <sighs> <laughs> that isn't what it is. <laughs> okay, this will be one camera, but it's going to be seriously out of sync. Okay. All right. Okay. Oh dear. All right. We have a camera. This is this is okay. It's better than nothing. All right. So um, I'll just have to work very slowly. So imagine you have a point, a point which is the base of a tornado, a vortex, or you have uh, uh, the boundary layer on the double layer of a plasmoid, that inner sheath where the action occurs. Um, or you have a lot of electrons in a very fast discharge going into a focal point. That is a lot of bunching of electrons. Uh, or you have that free electron laser going in. Whatever it is, um, in, in the case of the sound uh, process, you're, you're building and you're building and you're building. And what I'm saying is that, um, and I've been arguing this for some time, is that when the 
um, the uh, electrons are condensing, they need to produce, they need to get rid of heat in order to condense. In fact, all, all the matter needs to lose heat. And so they've got less fr freedom of movement. And, and, and in the process of losing heat, they are getting to that coherent state. But um, whilst they are coming and being driven together, the temperature is going up. And so they're smashing into each other. And as we showed the other day, when looking at the uh, work of, of, of Huang, uh, he's saying that the, 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 when the cavitation bubble collapses, in his case, in the example he gave, I think it was 45 uh, micron bubble, when that collapses, that produces a temperature of 5,100 Kelvin. And from Parkamov's uh, 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 understanding, that will, f over 50% of the electrons or the electron or the, the lattice uh, metal, uh, if that's involved, will produce uh, cold neutrinos. And cold neutrinos are uh, the, uh, the, the analog of relic neutrinos that are bathing us from the cosmos. And with that, I can probably go on to <laughs> the slides. Okay, so uh, let's see. Okay, so um, what you are looking at here is a black and white photo of the device that tracked the heavens looking for uh, this N radiation after he had um, established its existence. Uh, to see if it was gravitationally lensed and you have basically what, what's essentially a pan lid here and it's focusing onto the target here and um, uh, to Geiger counter actually this is the Geiger counter with a beta source attached to it so it, it's both of that if you look at uh, um, the promo for Space Earth Human I actually have a different uh, um, for color photo of the same device and I think this is the Geiger counter on the back side and so the, the important thing here is that the the pan because um, because this is like a uh, light if you, if you have light that will bounce not only go through glass but a proportion of light will bounce off um, the planes in glass even though it's transparent and Parkamov argues the same thing occurs with um, solid matter. That the uh, relic neutrinos from the cosmos are reflected, refracted, and reflected uh, from dense matter, and so you then have this huge area uh, reflecting a proportion of the incoming relic neutrinos onto the target, which is a little clearer to see uh, in the uh, one here onto the target with the guy the Geiger point Geiger counter or whatever and so uh, so steel mirror with parabolic service Geiger counter with beta source here that's the steel mirror uh, stepper motor the stepper motor was there to scan the heavens uh, uh, rotation mechanism around the axis of declination and stepper motor control device so you know everything's there uh, I think this is the yeah the stepper motor control device Okay, so this is the device he used. They used it for two decades, and uh, in the case uh, of the sample that's in here, he used the beta gamma isotope uh, of 60 cobalt, and this is something that comes out of the waste of nuclear reactors. And so uh, a neutron goes into uh, uh, metal, and it produces this radioactive isotope. And why would you choose 60 cobalt? Well, it's an absolutely beautiful isotope. It has a, a very low half-life. I think it's uh, around about five years. Uh, it's half the half-life of tritium. But of course, it's a metal, so it's got extreme density. So if you have something that has a, a, a low but uh, uh, positive uh, uh, interaction chance uh, with a nucleon, if you have more nucleons in the same space, you've got a more chance of it occurring. And then the... The other point, the other one that he used was, uh, or a ball with a diameter of three millimeters made from potassium carbonate. Potassium carbonate. The natural mixture of potassium isotopes contains 0.12% of the radioactive 40 potassium. Now, uh, this was quite disappointing because I, I, I kind of worked from um, the understanding that um, potassium was like 
the second most unstable isotope from primordial generation. So like all of, of all the isotopes we have on Earth, uh, um, uranium-235 is the most unstable. It's about 0.3 of the length of so-called the universe. Um, and um, potassium is, I think, 0.9. Uh, but obviously uranium isn't a beta isotope, uranium-235, but potassium-40 is a beta isotope almost entirely. It does do uh, electron capture and it does do uh, positron emission, but almost all the time it will do electron capture, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, electron emission, beta decay. And uh, so uh, I suggested that this might be the most useful uh, uh, fuel in Lena. And actually, as I started looking at the literature, many, many, many different uh, experimentalists used potassium and often those that used potassium were the ones that are the most aggressive so um, if Dave and Henk were wondering why uh, I suggested using potassium and in fact it was one of the very first things I said to uh, Henk uh, and that uh, uh, addition created the video called Evo Blaster which I think was the second or first video I think the second video that was shared uh, from the Vega experiment series and um, it, it delivered much much more than I could have possibly wished for in that video and I'm going to talk much more about that in the future but now you are seeing in this video the rationale behind suggesting that um, way back when uh, okay, so in the next slide, uh, I've got a pit take, taken a couple of other uh, things here. Um, so inverse beta decay reactions with a stable nucleide inevitably have an energy threshold. For example, only antineutrinos with energies greater than 1.8 mega electron volts can cause reaction 2.47. So here you go, 2.47. So this is... Uh, uh, I guess it's an anti-neutrino, is, is it saying? Anti-neutrinos, uh, well, it might be the wrong way around, but anyway. <laughs> the, po the point being is that uh, um, these are, in sorry, these are inverse beta decay nuclear reactions. So a normal uh, uh, reaction forcing an electron out would need an anti-neutrino, I guess. Um, uh, anyway, the point being is that um, he's saying that if, if the isotope is stable it does not want it, you need to put a lot of energy in and have the the uh, um, neutrino able to interact with it uh, for it to occur it says it is clear that neutrinos or anti-neutrinos of ultra low energies which have a kinetic energy close to zero and a very low resting energy cannot enter the nuclear reaction of inverse beta decay with stable nuclide so basically what he's arguing is that and and with good reason is that cold neutrinos literally do not have the energy even if they're interacting all day long with stable isotopes to cause them to emit uh, or, or a positron or electron they can't do inverse beta decays they just can't do it okay no visuals ah okay all right so <laughs> Oh dear. Uh, what did you not see? God, what a disaster. <laughs> I'll do this again. Okay, so did you see this? Did you see this? So ba basically, th this this is the uh, device here, and uh, he had 60 cobalt, and he had uh, potassium carbonate. And... Okay, excellent. All right, you saw that. So, it, okay, it's not changed. Uh, inverse beta decay reactions with a stable nucleide inevitably have a high energy, have an energy threshold. For example, only antineutrinos with energies greater than 1.8 mega electron volts can cause reaction 2.47. It is clear that neutrinos, antineutrinos of uh, ultra low, en oh, no, <laughs> ultra low energies, which have a kinetic energy close to zero and a very low resting energy cannot enter the nuclear reaction of inverse beta decay with stable nuclei. So essentially, if you have a hill and the hill is one kilometer high uh, and you need to go over that hill to be able to cause a stable nuclei to emit an electron or a positron, uh, it ain't going to happen if all you can do is push it up the first five meters. It's just you're not going to get over that hill. It's just not going to happen. There is a barrier. It's not going to happen. So this doesn't uh, uh, cause decay of uh, uh, stable nuclei. Okay, but this isn't the only 
part of what's going on in Lena, in my view. You've got this electronuclear collapse, okay, but um, it, one is feeding the other. It's not a simple uh, overall picture. So um, in, f in papers, uh, 55 to 57, the idea was put forward that neutrinos or antineutrinos of ultra low energies should be used for detecting the reaction of inverse beta decay of these particles with beta radioactive nuclei, in which there is no energy threshold. For more recent publications on this topic, okay, so th th there are some of his uh, papers. Um, the selection of electrons, positrons, additionally arising uh, during inverse beta decay against the background of electrons, positrons, of direct spontaneous beta decays, blah, 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 is substantially facilitated by a radical difference in the spectra of electrons, positrons, of inverse and direct beta decays. Now... It was mentioned earlier a little bit by David Boutelier in the uh, um, in the uh, uh, chat. So if you weren't watching the chat, you were watching this on a, a phone. You did not see him get close to guessing. But this is the difference. What you have here is normal beta or positron type energy spectra. Okay. What what this means is when a natural uh, 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 decay occurs you get a spread spectrum of energy starting from down here all the way up the peak most of them around this area and then down to the maximum energy that a, a beta particle a, a positron or electron can be emitted from a unstable nuclei okay this is the maximum the difference between cold neutrino and normal beta and positron uh, sorry, beta decays, electrons and positrons, is that all, every single one, every single one that gets emitted, every single one, is at that maximum energy. What is that? That is monochromatic. What do I mean by monochromatic? I mean, they are all, all of them, at the same energy. So you have an electron at exactly the same energy. An electron at exactly the same energy. Which means what? It means that they have the same de Broglie wavelength. Now, what do you need, according to Ken Shoulders, to feed an exotic vacuum object? You need electrons. So, at the very least, you emit very high energy electrons, so 1.55 MeV or something from your potassium, okay, into your gas. That will ionize many, 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 many ion, uh, 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 atoms, which will produce a lot of electrons, which will feed your EVO, okay? Not feed your ego, feed your EVO, okay? So that uh, is going to keep it alive. When it's alive and it's got a lot of electrons coming in, those are condensing. They are producing, in my view, cold neutrinos. Okay? So you have a virtuous cycle. One feeds the other, feeds the other, feeds the other. Okay? Then, with the more cold neutrinos, you can interact with um, more... Uh, um, Potassium, if you've got it in there, or I like to choose indium uh, 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 because indium has most, almost all one beta isotope. Uh, I think you'll find that the choice of, and this I've never disclosed this before, it's not been discussed by uh, uh, Solin, but I think zirconium, uh, I'm going to look right now, I, I, I think in the back of my head I've got that zirconium has uh, one uh, unstable isotope. Uh, which may be affected by his system and actually be better than some of the ele other elements that he, he would use. Uh, give me just a second. Uh, so if I go here to nanosoft.co.nz and I go to show element data up the top here, maybe I can go in a little bit bigger so you can see what I'm talking about. Show element data here. And I choose zirconium. Okay. Okay. And I might be completely wrong. Uh, beta minus. There we go. So uh, what is the proportion of that 
in the crust. Not a lot. Oh, here, this is the one. This is the one I'm talking about. It's a double beta minus. <laughs> it's it's zirconium 96. It's a double beta minus and it's 2.8%. Yeah? And it's got a 3.4 mega electron volts emission. So, zirconium. If you had these coherent matter structures producing a lot of cold neutrinos could yield 3.4 mega electron volts and this is uh 2.8% it's much larger than 1.28% now if you actually look at the half life of of this beta isotope it's like ridiculous it's absolutely insane um however in theory the half life largely can, can go out of the window uh, when you are talking about a large flux of uh, um, cold neutrinos. So, it's not just that it's producing the cold neutrinos, it's that the cold neutrinos, I believe, get swept up into the torus of the exotic vacuum object. And if you look at what Shishkin uh, and et al. Uh, Dubna City is saying, is that the um, the magneto -tora electro -ra electrical radiation, the string vortex soliton version, is a condensed cluster of cold neutrinos. Now, if a condensed cluster, and if it's condensed, is it coherent? One would imagine it might be, like is proposed by Wheeler in the 1950s. If that is a co big coherent blob, and it comes into a load of uh, potassium-bearing uh, feedstock, then it could be the case that when that is energized enough because some of the uh, uh, potassium is firing out beta particles at 1.55 or whatever it is, MeV, and they're producing a lot of electrons, it's activating the thing, it gets very excited, it could potentially instantaneously convert a very large number of potassium ions uh, to calcium, yeah? releasing that beta particle, turning a neutron into a proton and shifting it from potassium to calcium. And in that case, you will have simultaneous release, i.e. in phase, electrons, the same particle, and at the maximum energy because it's an inverse beta decay. That is the recipe, the recipe for creating coherent matter. Okay, and this would be the same for like any beta isotope. So in many ways, the use of potassium excited me, and uh, um, I hope that this helps um, people understand, uh, particularly Dave and Hank, why I was suggesting using potassium. It's not just a trivial thing. Firstly, you need to get coherence. Uh, there are many ways to create coherence, and I've gone over a large number of them. Uh, we've shown experiments that we've done that show this process. I've shown about the, the vortices. We've actually got them on film. Uh, I've shown about the, the, the paired vortices uh, in various systems, and we've got those on film. Uh, we've even got the coherent matter waves on film, and we've got the coherent s spheres on film. And so um, these are producing what triggers the process it produces it uh, the cold neutrinos the cold neutrinos i mean you can do away with the cold neutrinos and you can still work with the coherent matter and if you drive the coherent matter and drive the coherent matter before long you will get a self collapse as i've gone through several authors that have come to the same conclusion and at least two of those are in working with people that are either in current US national labs or uh, uh, former employees of national labs. And, and so th this, this is not uh, junk science. It's not junk science. This is, in my view, how it works. And so you can do it with the electronuclear collapse directly, but when you bring the neutrinos into the cold neutrinos into the equation, uh, you can get a, um, a process where you can feed it beta isotopes uh, that um, can be influenced by 
this uh, low threshold for them to cause the inverse B to decay and produce and effectively yield a large amount of energy. So when you when you consider, so if I go back to the table here and we go to uh, potassium, so we go to potassium, where, where is it, potassium here, okay. Um, potassium has this uh, uh, potassium 40 and you've got this 0.12% uh, uh, of potassium uh, is um, this isotope and uh, it's producing uh, 1.5 MeV so it's uh, 1.505 MeV is, is what it's saying here um, so and it is basically the beta minus that will occur in this uh, instance so you're gaining 1.55 MeV from, from like when, when you're joining two hydrogen monoatomic atoms together typically you're gaining I, I don't know something like five electron volts so you're getting 1.5 million electron volts so this is like a very large number of uh, hydrogen monoatomic hydrogen joining together which is one if not the highest energy you will get out of a chemical reaction so this is absolutely insanely massive plus it could be coherent because they are monochromatic same thing same energy and if the, if if it's at a point where the 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 coherence of the uh, uh, cold neutrino uh, structure is sufficient that it is it just passes a threshold instantaneously to cause the decay of uh, um, the say potassium in this case then it will release all of those monochromatic uh, uh, beta particles at the same time which then can lead to further coherence and even if they are slightly out of phase then uh, you can imagine if they're fired into the torus uh, and start to condense that they're all much closer to their compadres uh, uh, energy and so um, they have less work to do like you have in the Lockheed Martin pattern where they having to go through this nano structure to become cohered and share their energy around or use the Aronhoff bomb effect to do it um, they're just doing it because they're practically all the same anyway I mean, you, you've, if, if you're already preaching to the converted, let's put it that way, uh, you've got a, a um, less of a hard job getting them to agree to a subject that they're all already mostly agreeing to, if you know what I mean. So you think of it like that. Uh, I'm going to show you also here indium. And so this might explain why I've used indium over the years. Uh, and so you can see indium here. Uh, is 95.72% uh, uh, indium, uh, what is it, 115. And that has a beta emission of 0 0.4990. And if we actually go, I'm going to go to, uh, uh, what, I'm, what I'm going to look at, Wikipedia, indium isotopes. Because... Uh, You can see here that it's 4.41 times 10 to the 14 years. So that's a lot of years. It's a lot of years. You compare that to um, uh, isotopes of potassium. Uh, 40 is it's 10 to the 9. So it's it's 10 to the 5. It's 5 orders of magnitude longer lived uh, ordinarily. But you've got a large and uh, much more of the matter is uh, that isotope you have 95.72 percent uh, instead of uh, 0.012 percent okay so it's a lot more uh, of the matter in there okay so um, I then have this to share with you in the future, this is in uh, Space Earth Human, in the future a technical generator of slow neutrinos can be used instead of a cosmic flow concentrator. 
A huge advantage of this type of energy compared to modern nuclear energy is that no radioactive waste occurs in the process of inverse beta decays. On the contrary, if nuclear fuel wastes, storage of which is a serious environmental problem, will be used as fuel, then in addition to the energy production, radioactive wastes will turn into non-radioactive waste. After the burning of radioactive wastes and solving the problems of their storage on this basis, natural radioactive isotopes can be used as fuel and, and above all, 40 potassium, whose reserves are huge. An important advantage of the new nuclear technology is the absence of neutron radiation, which greatly facilitates the problem of biological protection and allows the creation of compact and light installations. The fact that these plants, whose operation is based on induced rather than chain reactions, cannot fundamentally go into an explosive mode of operation. It's also very important. So what he's saying is, if you are driving the process to form the coherent matter that is doing the work of producing the cold neutrinos that is then doing the transmutation of the 40 potassium and getting that 1.505 mega electron volts per beta decay energy yield then when you stop the music the reactor stops and you've already seen in Vega experiments it takes an extremely small amount of time to get from no, uh, 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 what they call them, balls of fire in the reactor to balls of fire in the reactor. It's like literally like turning on a light. And so you can go and see that on remote view to ICU. Some of the GIF animations I've got in there where the power is turned on and off. It's literally instantaneous. Now we do know that you have to drive it a little bit harder, a little bit harder to get it to eat the matter. Okay? So it's in my view when it's eating the matter that it's really wanting the electrons from the matter that it's contacting. The, the, the sheath. Okay. So... Um, there's a couple of other things that I think are very interesting that can, that you need to consider coming out of this. I've just got a couple of uh, implications notes on here. Um, so implications. I don't know if you remember, but I did a presentation about seed germination. This is like the curve around where you take seeds and when you look at the potassium and calcium content in there before you germinate them and then afterwards in the dry weight in both cases, you find that when you have no... Uh, uh, calcium or whatever in the uh, cell uh, sorry in the growing medium uh, it, you have a change in potassium calcium ratio uh, afterwards but some people did not find this occurred but actually in the 2013 study if you go to our Facebook and look for that uh, lunar cycles or something you'll see that an Indian group they they looked at starting germination on like a few days apart across the year and they found that during the moon phases is when you got these uh, new ratios of, of potassium and calcium forming and uh, Alexander Parkamov argues in his book that all biology and so obviously the chickens of Kevran as well um, the chickens uh, producing calcium uh, when they have no calcium in their diet by giving them potassium this is this uh, trans transmutation where you are doing a beta decay and it's kind of like forcing it so what must be going on in those cells of that uh, creature is that it is forming, forming some coherent matter deliberately to cause this transmutation but if you understand what I've been telling you tonight all life can sense cold neutrino or rather relic neutrino fluxes because all life contains potassium. In fact, potassium metal was first uh, found in pot ash by taking trees and burning them and you get the, the ash and then you put the ash in water and so on. And the, from that you get potassium by electrolyzing that water. Okay, that's how it was first like synthesized. Yeah, and potash is used in alchemy. Why, why? 
Why do we need a very specific temperature and you get it to a certain blah, 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 and then suddenly the magic happens and you get transmutation? Well, I think maybe you're having an idea of how that might occur now. And so life can detect cold neutrino fluxes. And why I've got uh, three body alignments on here by Zhu. Zhu, if you go back to, if gravity can do this, what is gravity? I did this presentation in the lead up to the Space Earth Human Kickstarter. In, in the, that work, conducted between 1988 and 1999 by Xu Enzhu and his team in China, they found that during three body alignments, beta isotopes, cesium-137 and rubidium-87 in atomic clocks, changed their rate of decay. He found that the spectrum of the periodic elements changed their spectrum during three body alignments, i.e., the light that they got back when they were excited was different to when it was in uh, not in, in an eclipse, solar or lunar eclipse. He also found that the crystallization of metals changes during a three body alignment. And also using a sheet which was held by a weight, he found that uh, there was a sideways pressure, i.e. a force expressed onto a metal sheet during 3D, uh, th three body alignments. And so something was influencing uh, uh, um, light. It was inf influencing decay. Uh, so it's able to interact directly or indirectly. So so when, you, when I was talking in the last presentation about uh, Ruitskev, talking about the glow above Chernobyl being due to these uh, uh, monopoles that were produced by the turbine four uh, uh, accident that went into the water. These monopoles, uh, 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 which may be magnetically excited neutrinos or clusters thereof, are going into the air, which is composed of 20 plus percent oxygen, and they are causing the oxygen to change its spectral lines. And also they're in the locality of the nitrogen that's in the air, and that's basically most of the air. Um, and so you are getting this weird glow going on. This is a change in the spectral lines that you get from uh, 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 periodic elements. And I have witnessed this myself looking at Lyon and, and Hutchison samples under an SEM, where you hit it with an, a, 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 an X-ray, uh, sorry, a, a beta particle from the uh, electron gun, and that excites the, the matter and it produces a photon coming back. But the photon coming back is not the photon it should be. And so, um, and it's almost like at the angle it hits it that it ma makes a difference as well. And so, um, this, this, uh, 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 this, Xu, Xu Wenzhu did not have an explanation for all of these observations. He just knew that these observations were occurring and you could produce them every day of the week and you could go and look at the historical data from atomic clocks and still observe these observations. So he proved that three body alignments, i.e. gravity effects, changes, changes uh, the rate of decay of beta isotopes. Okay? And this is what was observed by uh, Parkamov using uh, this uh, device here. Using this device here, uh, when it's in the coming into spring summer the rate of decay goes up. Why? Because it, this is in the Northern Hemisphere. So this is in his East Moscow. In fact, this is actually out of the window. Uh, I've, I've actually <laughs> seen this. <laughs> it's the view from his window in his East Moscow apartment. And um, th this is obviously in the Northern Hemisphere. So in that spring into summer period, you are coming closer to the sun. And when you're closer to the sun, you don't have an extra gravitational flux because your solid angle from the sun doesn't change. This isn't neutrinos coming from the sun at all. Nothing to do with that. <laughs> Forget it. If you've got that in your head, it's not that. Because <laughs> the cold neutrinos don't have the kinetic velocity to escape the sun's gravitational well. They don't. So they stay on the sun and they do transmutation on the sun. <laughs> That's another topic. But they're coming out. Uh, sorry, they're coming from the cosmos and because the sun is like 99.8% or whatever, basically most of the mass of the entire solar system, anything coming into our solar system will be attracted to the sun. And neutrinos of whatever type are gravitationally affected. And so that they come and as the earth 
And the orientation of the Northern Hemisphere gets closer to the sun, then you get a higher flux of cold neutrinos. In this case, relic neutrinos from the cosmos. And by the way, they're all about 2 point something uh, EV, that the actual uh, uh, so-called temperature of them. So that they're all basically ready to be cohered, as it were. And, and this flux is constant. And when you have the three body alignments, like that Indian seed germination study, all the three body alignments of Xu Wenzhu, then in those instances, you have, uh, uh, because of the gravitational lensing effect, when you have the sun, uh, moon, uh, sorry, sun, earth, moon, or sun, uh, moon, earth, that gravitational lensing effect changes the flux. And in fact, you get a, diff a diffraction field uh, as well in certain circumstances as well. And so um, this lens is more or less of the uh, relic neutrino flux from the cosmos. So relic neutrinos exist. Get over it if you think they don't. They do. Okay. They are not the same as relativistic ne neutrinos. The de Broglie wavelength of something that's a much lower energy, which relic neutrinos are, is longer and covers a large area. He studied micron to millimeter versions. There are some people that say some of these cold neutrinos can be a meter in size. That's a bit weird when you think about it. There's a particle and it's a meter. Okay, uh, and I actually included the paper. I think uh, it's probably here. Uh, is it this one? No, that's gra gravity is uh, due to cold neutri relic neutrinos. Uh, this is reflection from material targets. So one of these papers, I think, is to do with that. But anyway, um, so uh, essentially what I'm saying is that um, all life, and this is said in Parker Mott's book, all life can sense uh, relic neutrino fluxes. And it's kind of like it's beyond most people's consciousness. And it may be the case that John Hutchison is not only detecting on his earpiece the um, uh, the the pops from the radio, he might be able to be more sensitive than others to the relic sorry to the technologically produced uh, cold neutrinos that are being produced by field interference in his samples. In the case of uh, um, people that are feeling weird. Uh, I, 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 Henk has discussed feeling weird around the Vega experiments and this is why we need to keep a distance from these things um, and you know when I, when I was with uh, um, Dr. George Eagley he said when he was filming young Israeli boys spoon bending and metal bending in uh, Israel uh, his uh, cameras and, and electronic watches and recording devices didn't work and that's exactly what was observed by the people that went into the Padmaswami temple in India when they went in there. They had to cut this metal band going around the room. And, and I believe there was probably a big uh, relic neutrino vortex in there um, that, that was probably causing that. And, and they basically broke the band that, that kept the vortex moving. And so... Um, uh, uh, essentially, um, Parker was saying, let's make a technological uh, solution to uh, creating these relic neutrinos, uh, which in that case would be called cold neutrinos. And using that, um, we can um, uh, deal with radioactive waste. So what I'm arguing is that um, we know we can create... Uh, if I go to the beginning of the presentation, we know that using something like a Vega experiment, we can create this uh, ball lightning effect. And we know that you can create something equivalent using HHO. Now, whether that's because it's doing the OH maser effect and, 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 and that's creating a baser and... Uh, it's, it's cohering in that way. It doesn't matter. We know that it transmute, transmutes uh, radionuclides. And uh, it, it can do, in from my view, beta isotopes would be easier to, to do because you don't have to go all the way to full electronuclear collapse. Um, but electronuclear collapse is a real thing. I've talked through several authors that have talked about it. Um, and 
that you know you can harvest this process the fact that you get these monochromatic uh, beta particles coming out um, that will aid the process of cleaning up any radioactive waste and so um, and not only that it will make it a fuel so I, I think actually that we can use the tritium water to make a gas and that gas can be used to deal with all of the other radioactive material in Fukushima so I believe that the tritium water is a huge part of the solution to the overall rem remediation of that site now of course tritium itself is not a boson that's uh, why in my view that it, it's one of the uh, it's the only um, uh, uh, radioactive particle that gets emitted from new uh, low energy nuclear reactions I've explained that <laughs> if you go higher then it's mostly stable but more than that it's uh, like uh, if you go from tritium you, you end up with helium and so uh, or alpha particle and that's one of the building blocks um, lower than that is a boson so and, and below that's a proton which is stable as well so it's it's the first fermionic isotope that isn't helium that is un that that is a fermion so it gets kicked out as a nucleus but if it I think maybe if, if you got h2 plus then maybe t2 plus would be equivalent um, and so uh, you can uh, do the same process uh, of, of uh, these clusters and and, and uh, causing them to fuse and maybe you'd end up with lithium in there lithium-6 or something I don't know yeah so I, I think that um, okay so I'm, I'm, I'm basically through that if people have got any questions they want some clarifications I'm sorry for the the overheating camera um, I'm gonna have to find a different solution for the summer uh, or maybe take a break like the Russians do <laughs> So yeah, I mean, the potash was absolutely key to alchemy. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, I'll have a, one point, point about, um, so so several authors have found that the cavitated water is good for plants, right? Not, not super cavitated water, but cavitated water, right? And uh, I believe that that will be because uh, they are, there are some of these uh, uh, relic, nu relic neutrino analogs, as in cold neutrinos, caught into the oxygen that's in the water and that then the the, the um that it becomes part of water again and then that gets absorbed by the plants and it's, it it means the water is very different because the neutrino basically has that negligible mass you would never be able to detect it but the water is different it is different <laughs> not all water is the same and what you're getting now is 100% proofs that water is can be different. It's not just because it says H, H2O, the O can be different. Uh, in fact, you can have different isotopes as well. That's a different matter. But um, the, the actual binding of uh, cold neutrinos into oxygen, let's say it's dissolved oxygen in the water, um, that, that is uh, um, a way that you can ingest this. Now, I've talked about that when I was in Sochi, the Russians were doing a study with some German group and they were they were doing a corona discharge onto water and then they were feeding that water to plants. And the plants uh, were germinating faster, growing faster, and they were more resistant to disease. Okay? Um, people uh, uh, have used... It, Shishkin did cavitated water from his cavitator and fed that to plants. And the plants were, again... Uh, had these kind of attributes so uh, I, I, we know that corona discharge produces in the extreme produces tritium which means in my view that it is creating coherence and that is forcing uh, uh, nucleons to fuse and and sometimes you get tritium e ejected um, but if, if, you, if you're doing the corona discharge into the water I, I believe you, you'll get some uh, uh, coherence some uh, electron bunching some production of, of, of relic neutrinos that will be magnetically charged they will form the monopoles and the monopoles will go into the water and it might be that the oxygen that has these monopoles attached are, are just more bioactive and because it's bound to the nucleus 
So I, I think there's something called Grander Water, I think it is. I think it's like an Austrian group. I think it might be Grander Water. And they find that if they put these, uh, these vials of Grander Water uh, in sort of uh, pipes, then the pipes don't um, fur up. And also, people have found that if you actually get a, a vial of this water and you put it um, uh, into, like, uh, I think I was told once, um, if you put it into, like, the, I think it, I think it was, like, cow dung or, or even um, chicken excrement, and it would normally go dry and, and so on, but if you put this in, the bacteria absolutely went bonkers. It went absolutely bonkers, and it uh, decomposed the the uh, waste very very quickly. But the 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 cell with the the this so-called activated water in it um, didn't change, and you could use it over and over again. And this mechanism would explain it that you have something that is coherent, and it, it is. Um, influencing the environment around it uh, in a way that's positive for biology and so uh, I, I'm sure many people can come up with different examples but what I'm trying to do is to get to the root scientific uh, mechanism behind these things at which I believe it, it all has a, a common uh, well as um, uh, is said by um, Simon Schnoll there is a common uh, uh, a cosmophysical factor in all random processes. It doesn't matter whether it's cell division, uh, uh, radioactive decay, in beta decay, uh, um, every single random process, they have a cos common cosmophysical factor. And it could be neutrinos, uh, but in the relic type, the type that can interact with matter. And uh, in theory, we can interact with them too and feel them. Okay. Okay, if the modified water gets vaporized and recondensed, does it still have the same properties? Um, uh, it, it 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 might be that the it might be that the um, the special properties are bound to the oxygen nucleus, and that they they get bound when it, 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 I, I'm not so certain that they would stay bound if it becomes a molecule with hydrogen or something else. Um, but it may be the case. Um, but when the oxygen is free oxygen, O2 as a solid liquid or gas, certainly that has these wonderful magnetic properties. Uh, um, and at that point, it can capture the material. And we, we have these two data points. That There's my own experience, but there is this data point from Sundarese and, and Bokris uh, from the 1990s replicate, replicating the George Oshawa carbon arc underwater. They found that they got iron produced only when there was oxygen dissolved in the water. If they boiled the water to get rid of all the dissolved gases and then they put nitrogen in and saturated the water with nitrogen, they couldn't get any iron produced. And so the oxygen was absolutely critical in there but they didn't know why but if you imagine you've got sparking going on every spark has an evo that will have condensing matter that will produce cold neutrinos the cold neutrinos will get magnetically excited with the all the electrical things going on that produces the monopoles the monopoles go into the oxygen in the dissolved water that forms clusters and i actually have maybe i have it here uh, muir's paper uh i mentioned him the other day in fact i hope i got his name right the other day I was trying to trying to wing it in in terms of my head, but I think I have his paper here talking about the Amasa gas clusters. Yes, I do here, and this is from ICCF twenty. And I wish I'd kind of seen him uh, or clocked this at ICCF twenty, but you know, uh, you only have so much brain capacity, I guess. <laughs> um, let me go here. 
Okay, so water clusters related to Amaz, I guess. Uh, Hidimi Mura. Uh, and he, so he talks about the background here and they use some equipment to measure the structures uh, or the the molecule shapes in there. And and these this is what he thinks the water clusters can look like. Um and so on. I actually think they're more like buckyballs type things. Uh, you can see it's kind of more getting more and more towards a, a ball shape. Um, I haven't read this paper recently, so you'll have to forgive me. Um, so he makes these proposals for the clusters. There we go. Um, but I think that if if the the nature of the oxygen changes or the free oxygen in there um, that might be able to bind material together uh, in a different way and, and actually Centilli called these things magnons um, so there was a lot of reference to magnetics in Centilli's work um, yeah You used to inject cold foul power station boiler water with Calgon. Bob G, a calcium phosphate water softening D. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, that, that's that's to get rid of the scale. No, no, there's this thing called Grander Water. I think maybe maybe there's a website for it. Grander? Grander? I think it's something like that. Grander Water? Grander Water. Grander. Yeah, here we go. Uh, I'm not going mad. Let me out. <laughs> okay. The universal power of water. <laughs> Grander is the original in the water revitalization. The Grander water revitalization is based on a principle of information transfer and by natural means transforms water to a very high, stable and biologically valuable quality. Right. So applications, products, and trade industry and agriculture. Water is more. You want tap water that your customers and staff members will truly enjoy drinking. So basically, intensifies the taste of food. Whatever drinking water tastes good. Remarkably soothing. Go and go and have a look at this. But. Um, they don't disclose how they make it, but I expect it's by either cavitation or, or <clears throat> uh, stirring, <laughs> vigorous stirring, which will give you cavitation, or a, a electrical corona discharge onto it. I imagine it will be something like that. Employ enjoyment and waste. Elevates the original taste of food, brings out the aroma and banquet food and drinks, improves baking results, enhances it. It does everything. My God. <laughs> Vitality and well, look, the cows look happy. They're so happy they made the background turn really lovely green. <laughs> Creates harmonious atmosphere in business and workshop. Oh dear. Anyway, go and have a look at Grander Water. Uh, anyway, there we go. <laughs> So yeah, um, how does structured water occur? Well, you know, it's got to have a reason to group together in a certain way. It does sound bogus, yes, but um, honestly, they apparently they what is grander? Oh, okay, we got something here. Water possesses an immune system. Oh dear, that doesn't sound good, does it? <laughs> <laughs> for the skeptics the basic idea behind the method proposed by john grander is to strengthen the self-cleansing effect and resistance of water by improving its structure ah there we go structure this creates a natural and stable immune system the grander water revitalization i mean i i think this is more than easy water um, but we know easy water will flow through capillaries faster than uh, normal water. I think that's the, the, the claim for it. The core element of grander water revitalization is water. Yes, well, that's great. <laughs> the active medium known as highly co 
highly coherent functional water. There we go. In the grander water revitalization unit consists of water with a high internal order and stability, made according to the special process and knowledge of jo Johan Grander. Through its high internal order, this highly co coherent functional water is able to transfer natural information and vibrations, natural information and vibrations, even to non-revitalized water, without ever coming into contact with it. In this way, water is naturally stabilized and biologically improved. Yeah. Ensuring reduced reduce use of detergents and cleaning agents. Protecting the heating system through cleaner heating water. Yeah, so people have said that they put this water uh, into their heating system. It just doesn't fur up. Or I think someone claimed that they put the, this water into, like, the flu... The, sorry, the, uh, the evacuation pipes uh, from a, like, a, a f fat frying, like, deep frying restaurant. And normally these, these vents, the... the, the the ducting gets completely caked with like a congealed fat but apparently by putting these devices in or something similar uh you don't get you don't have to clean it it doesn't deposit for some reason it doesn't deposit on the metal um these are the claims it either works or it doesn't i mean if it didn't work then you know people people wouldn't buy it i guess anyway i'm not vouching for grander water okay you can go and read it and you have your own opinion um um, but I, I, there is a lot of history of people treating water, uh, particularly with cavitation and uh, electrical processes, and then you, it does something different. And we already know that um, the strange radiation birdies are, can be laser-induced to be emitted from water that's had a strong magnet underneath it and exposed into sunlight. Now, I don't think it's the sunlight, and in fact, uh, uh, Perovskichov thought it was some large photon that comes from the sun. I don't think it is. I think what's happening is that magnetically charged uh, uh, um, relic neutrinos that are coming from the cosmos get attracted to the magnet, and they get, dis they get bound uh, to the oxygen dissolved in that water, and I think it's that simple. And when you fire the laser in there, uh, uh, that excites the, the water to emit the cluster or bound state uh, magnetically excited uh, cold neutrinos or cold neutrino condensates. And they come off and they form these these uh, magnetic monopoles uh, structures. So if you were to use that, so I'm gonna work backwards from the bottom. <laughs> Uh, so if you to were uh, so if you were to use the water in plasma electrolysis, the clusters would interact with the plasma. So if you were to use the water in plasma electrolysis, yes, yes. So if you were to pre-treat um, water that has these, so you, you take the learning from Prochkov's paper, assuming that that is correct, and but. Here is another question. If you go and look at the... Sorry, before I go back to that. Um, if you go and look at... Um, uh, uh, Zhigalov, I think he just uses a laser and points it onto um, a film. And I think he even gets the same birdies. And that struck me as a little bit weird until I saw that low paper where he's saying you can cohere matter just with a laser. The laser can do it. Um, so I would like to see some tests with water with just a straight laser. But the, the problem then is, is that the, the water might already have <laughs> the structures in there. So, you know, there's, I think there's some more work to be done there. But uh, um, uh, if you if you look at the 2004 or whatever it is paper that I shared in the last presentation about the Chernobyl effect, uh, um, where uh, the assumption is that the these uh, magnetically excited neutrinos or or neutrino cold neutrinos or cold neutrino condensates are going into the water the oxygen in the water um then the, the, you're getting a body of evidence you're getting a body of evidence so i, I suggested to huang that uh, in his next tests with his uh, uh, dual pipe cavitation system that he first deionizes the water then he degasses the water by boiling it. He then 
saturates it with oxygen and to see if he gets more carbon production okay so um and also at the end of his test to see if he gets oh minus in in his water uh to see if he gets that more hydroxy group in there um so if you the the solar system is not a void now that is the most important thing that that if i can if i can get to the actual slide uh not this one uh no no it's back here it's my ugly mug okay Uh, not that paper. Uh, not that paper. Not that paper. Emergent electroweak gravity. Yes, but here we go. I mean, if you follow what I give you, then... <laughs> if you go to this QR code, you'll know that they're saying that basically relic neutrinos could be the cause of gravity. Okay, and this is coming from CERN Theory Group from I think 2010, I think it is. Okay, so here we go. Can low energy neutrino condensates explain the lack of photon emissions in the new fire? Um, this is a very good paper. I'd go and look at that QR code. It's by David R. Andrews. Neutrinos permeate, sorry, neutrino fermionic condensate properties. Neutrinos permeate space and can pass through matter considerable distances. And this is not the case for cold neutrinos, but anyway, this is this is his paper from this time. If a vacuum pump capable of removing every molecule of gas from a perfectly sealed chamber were used on such a chamber, it would remove all of the molecules of gas but leave behind the neutrinos. I've had that on that introductory paper it's a presentation for space earth human for a good number of years now i put it in there for a reason why did i put it in there for a reason i don't do things without having a reason <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it is probable that space it, sorry it is probable that the space in the solar system as well as the interstellar and intergalactic space is filled with neutrinos perkins 2003 Gwenti and Kim 2007 and filled to a density sufficient to permit some degree of entanglement of this is ultra low energy neutrino wave functions uh, it may therefore be possible for a neutrino condensate to exist that spans the interior of a vacuum chamber and extends out into intergalactic space what i'm saying there and he does it in this paper he goes into the amount i think you need one times ten to the six cold neutrinos to be uh, relic neutrinos uh, to be uh, a, a coherent condensate and because they're all at the same temperature and the the average density because obviously obviously i've said these things are gravitationally lensed and they are, and I've given the examples of what shows that. Um, the the a the average density is one times ten to the six, I think. Uh, uh, you only need one times ten to the one, or whatever. It says it in the paper. It's like many orders of magnitude more relic neutrinos in the cosmos than needs to form one one coherent condensate in the entire universe entire universe and using that fact if you have a coherent matter when something is influenced in that coherent matter it's all influenced exactly at the same time think about what that means for so many things I'm going to talk about them but think about what that means for so many things I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to put a blog out probably over the weekend, maybe not, or early next week. And 
I recorded it a long time ago. It's part part of three, three in that series. Uh, when it goes up onto Remote View to ICU, I want you to think about what I'm doing and why I'm saying it in context with what you're reading there. And what does it mean? If NFCs, uh, this is uh, neutrino fermionic condensate, are the medium that is conveying spin waves and spin waves. Spin waves can travel faster than light, by the way. Uh, the, the, because if you're spinning, uh, it doesn't it, uh, um, violate relativity. Spin waves and spin waves can be excited by moving exposed electrons or other fermions at the speed of spin waves. It is determined by the ratio of spin stiffness to NFC density. Then a number of experiments may be possible. If the density of neutrinos is changed, then the speed of light may change. The speed of light may change. If the spin stiffness changes, then the speed of light may change too. If the relative speed of neutrinos can be increased, temperature of the NFC, then eventually the de Broglie wavelength will become shorter until the NFC ceases to exist and electromagnetic fields will cease to be supported. What does that mean? What does that mean? Can the results of the Casimir experiment be interpreted in terms of uh, NFCs? Probably, probably. I've had this out there for a couple of years now. <laughs> what are the implications of that, that saying? Hey, uh, hey, Bob, so build a platform surrounding an Evo. Um, I think more build an Evo that supports a platform. I think that's probably a better way of putting it. Um, we're going to come to that. We're going to come to that. <laughs> Baby steps. I'll give you something else which is very interesting. It might even be in one of the papers that you see on there. Um, they did a study where they took, I think it was Japanese oysters, something like that, or green lit mussels. No, it was oysters. And oysters open at a certain time in the day and, um, and a certain tide. So the tide has to be in a certain place. They, they open based on the tide. And they put these oysters in a uh, electromagnetic, like, like a Faraday box, and which was completely sealed from light. And then they flew them half of the way around the world. And they had them somewhere in North America. Uh, so completely different longitude, latitude, and on the other side of the planet. And the oysters basically started straight away opening and shutting with the tide that was local. That was local. They didn't see any light, they didn't see any electromagnetic waves. How did that happen? Well, cold neutrinos are gravitationally lensed. The tide is due to gravity. Ta-da! <laughs> da, 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 da.
So about LIGO, I believe LIGO is a dual use system. I'll say it now, I think it's more for detecting use of weapons made with this technology. Because um, when this technology is used as a weapon, it will um, influence magnetic fields hugely. It will influence gravity fields. Uh, um, and if they're really big EVOs, they will actually um, capture uh, cosmic flux of cold neutrinos, relic, relic neutrinos. And the result of that and uh, the result of that is that atomic clocks will change slightly during the period of that weapon being used. But because they change, they essentially put out gravity waves. And so um, having the LIGO gives you a, a, a detection system for the use of these, th this technology uh, as a weapon. Uh, you can send emails uh, to me via uh, quantumheat.org. Go, go to the comments, uh, go to the uh, contact there and there's a contact form. You can send a message that, through that. Uh, Gordon Doherty, I'll deal with the chitin and insect thing. Uh, I, like I say, I did the work on that about, I think, oh God, two or three years ago. And I, I have, it, it was just a very weird thing. I was thinking about it at the time and um, it was in, I think, May. I can't remember, maybe, maybe, it's a very spiritual thing. It was like in May. I had the window open like I do now, maybe, maybe June, May or June. And 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 a uh, 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 a uh, what do you call it a um, scarab beetle flew in a huge one. It just flew around the room, and so I got out the ultrasonic uh, microphone, and uh, I don't know, it disappeared, and then I found it, and I I looked at it under the microscope and everything. So I, I've got a lot to to to, to share about that and to talk about. Okay, so uh, I'll just do a quick summary. Uh, if anyone's got any specific questions, I'll answer them at the end. Um, most of what you need to know, uh, I've been sharing on remote view uh, uh, with the two key presentations at the beginning. Um, uh, with, the, with the sort of monopoles and the coherent matter. So um, th those were key moments. I talked about destruction of uh, uh, various uh, reactors but where potassium is involved then yes the first Vega video was with potassium and it's ego bla uh, Evo blaster um, and uh, that th there's more to discuss about this video it's, it's a very very important video um, then when then we showed uh, how the material this coherent matter can build and self-organize and group together and and Henk and Dave have been fantastic to work with uh, on on that and uh, um, uh, then we showed uh, transmutation that was only explainable by certain things uh, then we looked at uh, um, ancient construction technologies and how that relates to uh, telekinesis and so forth and mach ancient machining technologies and geopolymers um, and then we looked at uh, 
basically all the way up uh, and, and looking at simpler systems to create the same effect. I will do something electric uh, part to it uh, as soon as I can. I've got some fantastic stuff that, uh, that Dave has uh, produced and I need to walk through that. Um, and we, we looked at the relative between uh, you know uh, um, Hutchison effect and Matsumoto and uh, how, how this can be used for terraforming and probably uh, it is how we got the elements we needed for life and we're up to the present day and uh, uh, more recently I, I shared this 20, 1983 received paper uh, talking about bases which is a form of coherent matter produced at non uh, cryogenic temperatures uh, I'd previously talked about the Solian pa paper which is using electron bunching to create coherent matter solitons of two magnetic charges that then cause electronuclear collapse then I uh, showed how an analog of ball lightning can be produced by bunched electrons and bunched uh, protons this suggestion by Matsumoto to work uh, 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 and explore new physics uh, Electronuclear, uh, uh, um, electron nuclear collapse, a slightly different name, came up with Adamenko and Vysotsky a little bit later and taken seriously now by uh, Topu Labs in the US. Um, uh, and not surprisingly, since uh, um, the production of coherent matter wave beams has been a, a, an incredibly important uh, area of uh, exploration by uh, the likes of the CIA and... Uh, um, Lockheed Martin and they're in their awarded patent I delved into that here and this is that awarded patent and it's overly complicated but essentially in their patent they say that they they, they have a little spikes here and they produce pulses and so it's basically an, uh, an Evo generator and the Evo generators come together to make a coherent matter wave uh, beam then I talked about how um, uh, ancient technologies knew uh, how this works uh, and that we can produce this as five-year-olds in the lab and uh, that they produce these figure of eight structures uh, and mostly what you get out of these uh, magnetohydrodynamic or hydrodynamic structures when they get strong enough is coherence that leads to the formation at the core of a diamond and this ex excellent example of what I call the pretzel uh, the slightly off-centered uh, dual vortex structure uh, leading to uh, a galaxy-like structure that produces elements based on the pressure in the system uh, at various points and this is the beautiful uh, pretzel as I call it from the 225 day reactor of Alexander Parkamov and uh, so on uh, and these this is this one from uh, uh, again uh, oh, anyway blah 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 um, then all the different coherent matter beams and so forth that were produced in uh, Dave and Henk's Vega experiments, their interactions, the, the, the forward-looking magnetic beam which forces uh, the uh, interaction, uh, the spin wave that's coming out in front of the uh, exotic vacuum object that, uh, which produces a field which the other ones see before the actual thing passes it. Pairs rotating together and then I talked about how uh, from 2012 that uh, the most experienced person in uh, um, uh, cavitation, Roger Stringham, uh, decided that this is producing Bose-Einstein condensates and uh, those lead to uh, matter collapse and it's the electron sheath that causes that matter collapse. So this is now three party, four parties that are claiming the same thing and same to, as our examples uh, that we have observed and then I talked about uh, um, how Alexander Parkamov uh, used this device over at least two decades to cause uh, isotopes of beta isotopes to decay and in our main presentation um, I started off by showing uh, these figure of eights both as uh, paired probably of the same pole uh, with the little spots uh, or of different poles like these where you have one smaller one and one bigger one overlaid uh, interacting and then in the center of uh, the deposit area we got this like twisted torus in one and an exploded one in another you can go and have a look at that video and various coherent matter structures uh, HHO gas and in a Henk Vega experiment 
and this is in Martin Lammer's Ultra Experiment and again these overlaying uh, vortices uh, uh, and the production of crenelated magnetite i.e. iron rich but magnetic spheres uh, with this uh, carbon film on the outside how the structures might be like this and we've talked about this with the uh, guions and this recent coherent matter thing that they think they've discovered something new but we've been talking about it for years um, and uh, here we go with the lion evos of various types the fact that it is in the solon patterns which is identical to this is from 1992 and these are from nine, uh, 2017 2017 um, and that it's this kind of structure and this is a the, mag the hydrodynamic analog of the magneto hydrodynamic structures this is the lensing that he used 60 cobalt and potassium carbonate and uh, this uh, is the decay I think that figures wrong by the way um, and then we have the inverse beta decay and he talks about how that cannot occur with a stable uh, uh, isotope because you need a high level of energy to trigger it and you do not have that with non-relativistic uh, cold neutrinos or uh, relic neutrinos and that they can only participate in uh, triggering inverse beta decay of radioactive isotopes so where they want to do it where nature wants to do it already then they can do it and uh, so uh, this happens and when when you do get the reaction you have a always a, uh, a maximum energy output and they're monochromatic and in fact what Parkamov would do is he would cover with foil or other materials to discriminate for the natural beta uh, decay energies and only look for the beta energies of Emacs. So, for instance, uh, beta energies, uh, Emacs for 60 cobalt or potassium. Those were uh, defining the screening. And that way he knew that, that he was getting an increase in uh, um, inverse beta decay from this lensing effect by the lens so he knew a hundred percent these were e inverse beta decays and the only way they could occur is by some form of neutrino like uh, uh, thing uh, in incident on the sample and so it's, it's a hundred percent proof and it's fully detailed exactly how how it's done and so you know it, it just is what it is um, and that when you know this uh, then you know that you can use it for dealing with radioactive waste and this is where I am really really interested uh, at present uh, to work with this technology uh, not only to deal with the tritium but deal with all the other waste on the site and uh, um, by by doing this we don't we don't want to be just burning the the gas to get rid of the tritium I think we want to be burning the gas to get use it as a tool to get rid of the other radioactive material on site and then I just talked about the implications for things like seed germination and why activated water is good for plants and other things uh, the fact that it is, is, is noticed it noted in uh, Parkamov's book that uh, all biology senses it and I believe that that is, is, is the case and I then revisited the three body alignments of Zhu et al so there we go, I go. so um, uh, any questions uh, if not I will you that's okay with you sorry about the camera I've got another problem here to deal with but uh, obviously we can't do it when we've got hot air coherent not cohesive Okay, so thank you very much, guys. Uh, uh, I hope this was useful to you. Um, it, it's really getting down to the, the deep understanding uh, of what is so special about uh, the way that these structures both can form, uh, how they can produce something that then can interact with other matter, and we can do more useful work than even just uh, producing excess energy, but in the process of producing, doing that work in this novel way uh, you are producing excess energy and when I say novel biology has been doing it forever <laughs> so uh, 
with that, I will say thank you for your time and good night, sayonara, uh, dobro noc, buenas noches, and uh, buena sera. Uh, I'll see you later.